So uh, I'm here on the couch with Jam Rostron, uh, a musical and visual artist um, whose music often challenges us to think about the status quo and power structures and gender and family and many other issues. Uh, their new album is called Powerhouse. It's coming out on DFA in November. Please welcome Planning to Rock. Thank you so much. Um, I thought we could just hear Transom, the lead single first from the new album, just as an opener. Transom, new single. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been out for very long, in fact, has it? So, um, You mentioned when we had a quick chat before that each of your records feels like a maybe a separate chapter, or that you couldn't have made each one without having made the previous. Um, I mean, I thought we'd start in the present day, really, but we can kind of loop back to it eventually. Could you give us a bit of an idea about where you are now as a musician and what this album kind of represents for you? Sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting that this is like my fourth album. Um, and if I was to think back on all the albums, like the first album I wrote called Have It All, um, I kind of wrote that on stage. Like I, I was like making music on my own here in Berlin and like performing as much as I could in small venues. And I would just test material out, like super punk <laughs> sort of. Um, Berlin is a great place for that. And, um, and then when I got the chance to actually make that into an album, um, there were a lot of songs that um, were about leaving the UK, leaving what I thought was home and finding a new home. Um, and then my second album was really, uh, I would say like um, in reflection to that, it, it kind of made me understand that the first album was really like my life up until that point, which was a long time. And then from that to have like two, three years, four years to make another album, like I really needed to live to make another album. Um, so where I am now is, um, I feel I get more and more direct with my music, clearer, more like, this is what I'm thinking, this is where I am, this is what I need to share. And I think from recording for so many years now, what I feel for me, music as a language, it's a space giver, like it creates space. Um, and it's definitely given me a space to understand myself, and to be able to explore um, like personal issues and also like my politics too and politics. Um, yeah, on your previous album, there was a definite change in terms of your directness. Mm -hmm. A lot yeah. of the track titles, very bold, uh, misogyny, drop dead, patriarchy over and out. Mm. You were very direct with it. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, did it take you a while to feel comfortable just being that direct with your words? It took me being disappointed with my own album. <laughs> uh, like with W, um, I really felt like I was being direct and um, talking about personal issues and also like about gender and about my sexuality and also about how I felt about patriarchy and it just didn't communicate, it didn't cut through and I was, you know, I loved that album. I had to make that album to get to make All Loves Legal. Um, but I had a bit of a crisis after W, after my second record and to get myself through it, I really started to ask what music was for me. You know, there's a lot of people making music and it's amazing. And so I had to work out what music was for me, what was my purpose, you know, like how could I use music? And so I kind of set out an exercise for myself. I was like, okay, I want to write a, like a song about patriarchy. And I really asked myself like, how do I feel about it? What, you know, and my feeling was, is patriarchy is shit and I just want it to get out of the way. It spoils, ruins everything. It's a terrible invention. So I was like, okay, write a song like that. And so I wrote Patriarchy over and out. And the lyric is just like patriarchy, um, you're out of date, get out of the way. And for me, it was a breakthrough because I think, I feel like I managed to write a song about patriarchy that isn't confrontational, it's open, people can connect to it. They don't feel like they don't take it personal, but they get it. 
and it was a dance track. It was the first time that I really kind of constructed a dance track that was like super dance floor friendly and energizing, um, charged and clear. And then from that track, I was really, like it was very easy to write the rest of All Loves Legal. Like it was a joke, like I told my manager like the first song was Patriarchy Over and Out and I remember she was like, woo. And then I was like, don't worry, the next song is not gonna be that intense. And then the next song was Misogyny Drop Dead and she was like, whoa, okay. So um, yeah, it, it's, but the nice thing about being really direct and open at the same time is like All Loves Legal really, created a space for me to share and people completely talking to me about their feelings about these issues and spaces that I didn't have before, so yeah. Um, we'll talk a bit more about your songwriting process in a bit, um, but we should, we should work out a bit more about who you are and you've lived in Berlin for a long time. Where are you from originally? I'm originally from a village called Dunsker <laughs> on the outskirts of Bolton, which is northwest uh, UK, like right up in the north. And um, What was that like as a place to grow up? I mean, there was a bus every six hours at the end of our street um, to Manchester. <laughs> so as soon as I could, I would like get on that bus to get to another city to meet people and have a life. I mean, it was, it was rural and uh, out in the sticks. So yeah, like it took me a long time until I found people that I could connect with. And did you have family that encouraged you to make music or? Yeah, definitely. Um, my mum's a really big influence for me. Um, my mum loves music um, and it's a bit emotional for me because this is very much what this new album's about. The album's called Powerhouse and basically the powerhouse is my mum. Um, um, yeah, she like has, still has like a really big record collection and would always play music every day. Like really, especially in the morning, like really early, getting herself, you know, ready, loud music. And um, it was a big influence on me um, and it got me really into music. Yeah. And pop music or other kinds of music? My mum. Mm. Oh, I mean, everything. Like, a lot of, like, a lot of, I mean, massive Aretha Franklin fan. Um, big voices with lots to say, basically. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I always said that my, I would watch my mum, like, play her records and literally, like, put the music on, like, armour. Like, really, like, she's, right, ready for the shit day I've got ahead of me. Um, and it... I don't know, it, it introduced me to the magic of music, like what music can do for you. And uh, you were trained, classically trained as well, right? Violin? It's a myth. Really? <laughs> it's a wiki myth. I Ooh. love it. It makes me laugh every time. And it, I, I delete it, people delete it, and then it pops up again. There's somebody <laughs> out there that needs planning to rock to be classically trained. I am not classically trained at all. I am, I am totally self-taught, like, yeah. Is violin correct? I did have a violin, yeah, I did. Um, but um, I wasn't trained. Um, you were also, but you were making music at home. Is it right that you were also making like tape loops and playing with tape and things? Yeah, basically um, I left school when I was 14 and, um, and my sister as well when she was 15. Um, school was terrible. And we were lucky that, well, not my dad, but my mum was definitely like, you can leave school, just stay at home. <laughs> And um, so I spent a lot of time at home with my sister and we, you know, this is like, oh shit, I was born in 1972. So that was like early 80s. And so, you know, cassette players and tape to tapes. <laughs> and yeah, we would like listen to music, recording music in our own way. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of music that was around at the time did you like? Oh, I've been... Oh no, hell no. Oh. Um, sorry. <laughs> Just as a local. <laughs> no, I know, band. I know. It's weird because I think I was really in a in a. I was not connected to any. It took me a long time to find music that I liked, but I like pop music a lot. And I was thinking about this because I I, I thought this question would come up. <laughs> it does come up. Um, Joyce Sims. I don't know if anybody knows Joyce Sims, but she released an album in the eighties called Come Into My Life. And it's really synthy, poppy, beautiful, like love songs mostly. Um, and she wrote it, recorded it, produced it, uh, amazing talent. And like her songs were like, I would see her on top of the pops and 
yeah, so yeah, kind of synthy pop, to be honest. Um, and then you ended up, as I guess a lot of British pop musicians did, particularly maybe in that period, you went to art school. Mm -hmm. um, um, what kind of art were you actually making? Was it music or visual art? Or? I mean, how I got into art school is funny because I didn't have any exams or qualifications. And my mum, so my sister's autistic. And so we were both at home like, my mum got my sister into a local art school. Like she hustled, got my sister in there. And then when I came to an age where I could go to an art school, my the teachers were like, well, if you're as nice as your sister, we'll let you in without any qualifications. And then I got into art school at Sheffield. And in the interview, they were literally like, how have you got here? Because you don't have any of the qualifications. But I just was like drawing a lot and sort of painting and like trying to make art. But when I got to Sheffield, um, Sheffield then was a very special art school. You could move between different departments, so you could go into performance. They also had like video. I discovered video basically, and I, had, I could use video cameras. And I started to make video art and make music to the videos. And this is how really I started to make music. But it was like for video art in a way, like performance art as well. No, kind of like like not then, not at all. How I got into performing is totally different. Um, what kind of things would you put in your videos though? I put a friend in a video. <laughs> I would film a lot of my friends and make them do things and I would put music to it <laughs> and was very arty. To be honest with you, like when I got to art school, I couldn't believe that I had three years paid to do whatever I wanted. It was phenomenal. Like it was like the best and most important time in my life. Like I remember a lot of the other students were just like complaining, like I don't want to want to do, and I'm like, fucking, this is sorry, this is amazing. Like you know, I can make work and sort of do whatever I want. It was great. Um, and at some point, then you arrived in Berlin. Did you intend to move here, or how did you get here, and why did you stay? What did you find? Um, I got here. Um, on the back of two other friends who were making an art project here. I had no intention of moving here. Like, I, I didn't know what I, wa what I could do or what I wanted to do. Um, but when I got to Berlin, um, I just, I think the biggest thing for me was not being in the UK and not um, being in the culture I was brought up in. And the biggest thing actually was nobody knowing my class where, you know, like my background, they couldn't locate me, they couldn't, you know, I was just freed, you know, nobody could, it was just really freeing, actually. So that was, and then I liked that, and so I stayed. Um, when you, so you moved to Berlin in 99. Mm -hmm. um, your first album came out in 2006. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm kind of curious about what you were filling your days <laughs> with in those uh, seven yeah. years in between. What did you get up to? Um, I mean, I did a lot of money jobs, a lot. Um, and parallel to that, um, I was kind of secretly making music and recording songs. And I don't know exactly how it happened, but I, I just started to, to like, like, D, like, not DJ, sorry, um, play live, like try and sort of perform my music live and like in small parties, private parties and, and it just started to build basically. And then from that, a friend of mine put me in a, a music festival in Amsterdam and um, I just remember being terrified. I was on stage and I just had a microphone and I was, my music was playing and my videos and I was just like walking around on the stage like this, like terrified. And um, a musician called Kevin Blechtum, who, she's not really that active now, but she's an amazing electronic uh, musician, like phenomenal, like genius. And she, was, she, she saw me after the show and she was like, you're amazing, who the hell are you? And she was living in Berlin and so we formed a friendship and then we started to put on shows together. And then from that I did a gig in Hamburg in the Poodle Club and um, Melissa from Chicks on Speed saw me play and offered uh, to put out my first record. Um, I'm gonna play a track from this record which is possibly not that representative of everything that you do, but I feel like it gets at something slightly different. It's called the PTR show. Oh. <laughs> um, and it's very brief actually. Um, I'm kind of detecting show tunes and music call and like possibly more common wise <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to play that one just because 
it kind of showcases a obvious humour that seems mm -hmm. to be quite a key part of of what you do. Um, can you put that in context a bit with the kind of um, instruments you were using? You were just making everything on your own at the time. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about you know why you would end up making <laughs> a little piece like that. Well, musicals is the key. Like I, I love musicals. And me and Kevy would make like these musical marathons where we just like watch as many musicals as we could, like in a night. Um, yeah, I mean, sorry. What's, what's your favorite? Oh my god! I mean, I, I do love West Side Story. Just you know, of course, like politically, there's, there's it's problematic in some ways, but it's still like you know, I don't know. There were, I was fascinated by harmonies, by you know, like how putting music together, different instrumentations, and also humor and attitude. Like for me, that first album was really about working out what was my musical attitude and how could I use music um, to express my attitude, you know? There's also a kind of element of, if you're gonna use humor, you have to have a, a sense of, um, kind of shamelessness, you have to be willing to mm. put yourself out there and mm. laugh at yourself as well. Mm. Is mm. that something that's, you know, you've kind of drawn on in, in general, like the boldness of that? Yeah, I mean, I think with my first album, my first shows, I had a lot of attitude. Like, I, I think I, it was really a lot of fun. Um, it was very exciting to suddenly have audiences, to connect with people um, and to be playful. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I want to fast forward now a little bit uh, to a track called The Breaks, mm. which is from your album W. And I want to show the video because at this point, you also had a particular visual look, mm. which was mm. pretty cool. So um, can we get the video, please? Um, a lot of artists have used um, masks or various other kind of physically altering elements for various reasons, but what was your reason to create a kind of face, a new face? Um, that, that was spe like specifically, like I was interested in um, changing or like um, exploring in a way the gender of my face. Like if I increased my brow, then in a way my gender would become kind of more open and less identifiable. And it was really like, uh, it was a lot of fun. It's so funny to see that now because that was shot near Schunefeld and it was so hot and the prosthetic was actually putty and it just kept sliding off my face <laughs> and we'd have to do it really quick <laughs> and then it'd be like sliding off my face. But it was really, because I, I make all the videos myself, I, and, and the reason I do this is because I, I love it. Like, it's really, again, like another language for me to play around and understand things, you know? And especially for me, like, image, moving image and music together is like my favorite. Like, it's just, ugh, it's, it's, I love it. So, um, you know, and I get this playground where I can really. Uh, do whatever I want and become in a way people like or become in a way who I want to be you know like uh, and definitely from exploring like my personal like sort of exploration yeah um could you explain a bit about your studio your production setup at the mm. time there are certain sounds certain instruments that you go back to quite mm. frequently mm. um but you produce the whole thing yourself yeah um give us an idea of what your kind of staple materials were for that record Wow, this is interesting. So um, my relationship to gear has changed over the years. I think, you know, my fir the first record I, I made in, in, the, in the, f the room that I was living in, in Berlin. So it was very, very DIY and it was very, as they say, like in the box. You know, I'd have like a few MIDI keyboards and then for W I got into more hardware, I guess. But then it's really expensive um, and you know, like my, like I'm, I'm, I've been, I've been very fortunate that there've been labels that have wanted to release my music um, and supported me. But even with that, it's really, it's an ex, you know, it can be an expensive thing to do. So <clears throat> I started to really embrace digital production, really from a sort of like economic perspective. Whereas, like, I love that I love digital software. You know, I think it's great because it means 
everybody and anybody can make music and I think that's very, very important and it was definitely gave me a chance to make music the way I wanted to. Um, and fortunately, I do really like um, synthesized sounds, you know, so, so I've gone from like having quite a bit of hardware and then having to sell it <laughs> and then being more in the box and then loving that. Um, also in terms of like for Powerhouse, for example, like I recorded that um, over a period of like four years and everywhere, wherever I was, whatever jobs I were doing, you know, whether it was being in LA or in London or here or wherever, and it meant that I could always work, you know, and I like that too because, you know, for me, my music is very much about my life, and so if I'm making music on the run, like wherever I am, then that's, it's just feeding it all the time, and I like that flexibility, yeah. Um, what about saxophone? love saxophone and it's, it's real saxophone <laughs> i love the real and i love the synthesize because there's something about that instrument that is it's sexy and hilarious you know it's, it's like you it's just a beautiful instrument and also there's so much humor in it too and and i really admire anybody that can play the instrument as well but i, I don't you know it's an interesting i mean joy sims used a lot of saxophone in her pop songs back in the 80s and i think like you know, like that's definitely influenced me, but um, as instruments go, I love strings because they just make me cry. They're so emotional and powerful. And I think that's why I've, I first thought I'll try and play violin when I was a kid. Um, and, but saxophone, yeah, so just, it, and also it just takes up so much space. It's like, you know, like you, it's, it's an, yeah. Um, related to the use of the prosthetics, the uh, putty, um, you have consistently put your voice through different processing effects. Um, and I guess there's a kind of related tar uh, purpose to the, both of those things. Can you tell me a bit about some of the things you were doing with your voice on the early records particularly? Um, pitching my voice, um, I mean, I spend a lot of time uh, in the studio and you know, like, you, you know yourselves, when, you, when you're working, you noodle and noodle and noodle with sounds, you know? Like, you're just, like, bending stuff, pushing stuff as far as you can go with it. And I did that with my voice, and what I did was, I don't even remember how it happened, but I sang on a song that I'd written, and I sung it higher than it should have been, and then I pitched it down. So I didn't use gear, I just sung it too high and then pitched it down. And, like, on a personal level, when I heard that voice, it was like, there I am. I was like, wow. I really related to that voice more than I related to my so-called voice that you hear. Um, and it blew me away. And I just thought it, that <laughs> sounded so good. And I was like, okay. So I, and I think W, the second record, was the first record that I really tried that method on. Um, and it really brought me closer to myself, it made me um, get to know myself. I mean, for this record, you know, because also I did it for All Loves Legal, and I also do it live as well. Um, and it's interesting because when I first started doing it, people were like, well, that's not your real voice. But for me, it's, it's like my authentic voice. And it's also my authentic voice in terms of my gender identity, of being a queer gender-like person for being gender queer. Um, and and it really, you know, in my private life, it really helped me, um, like, it helped me come out as a genderqueer person. Um, and so therefore it is very authentic for me. Um, and, but in terms of actually then writing songs with that voice, it just all started to really come together. You know, that again, it's about a certain attitude, it was, um, I could really speak through that, yeah. Uh, you have used the same studio for a long time, right? Or you had the same studio for a long, yeah, long time? I, yeah, I, 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 together with my friend Olaf, um, um, Olaf Dreyer from, uh, he's known as The Knife, um, we, put, we built a, a studio together here in Berlin about five years ago now, and um, the studio, we basically had like two soundproof rooms and the idea behind it also was that we, you know, that we would share it with a lot of our friends. It was, you know, cheap rent, and um, it turned out to be like such a special space. Like um, we wanted to create a space also that was for like uh, our queer 
uh, producer friends, um, female identifying friends that don't have gear. We just shared everything and it made for such a, um, like such a special safe space um, and also an educational space and a space where, you know, because if you're producing on your own, it's, it's lonely. You know, it's like nights and nights, days and days. It's really lonely and it's really nice to have people around. I, and for me, and for Olaf as well, because he works a lot on his own, um, it was nice to have some human contact with people that were also making really, really interesting work. So, and like right now, like I finished my record and so there are four other producers in there right now. So like Sky Deep, um, Paula Temple, um, and Pan, they're all in there now, like making amazing music. And so it's really, it's, it's an inspiring space, yeah. Before you released W, you also worked with Olaf uh, and, well, both of The Knife and Mount Sims on an opera. Mm -hmm. um, did you know anything about opera before you did that? None of us did. <laughs> we actually, we all went to the opera here. We were like, we better go and check out what an opera is. <laughs> I mean, we knew it like it's a recording, but like, you know, we'd never been to an opera and it was like, felt really serious, like the deal, you know, like so. Mm. Um, the opera is called Tomorrow in a Year, mm. and it's um, inspired by Charles Darwin, mm. right? Um, tell me a bit about working on that, mm. and particularly working on it as a group, because I gather that when it finally came to be performed, it was quite different to how you'd written it, right? Yeah. Um, I guess, I mean, when you're so used to having total control of your projects, how was it firstly to collaborate with a bunch of people and then for somebody else to perform it? Um, I loved it um, because, you know, like when I'm working on planning to rot stuff, it's about me, it's planning to rot stuff, and, but um, it's very clear. So like for me to work with other people, it's very exciting because it challenges me, you know, it opens up like my skills, it, it just opens me up. How it happened actually was it was Olaf and Karen that got the commission, but at that time, like I was still finishing W and I really, for W got really into acoustic recording. So I was recording a lot of percussion and I got really into mics and all that stuff. And Olaf had never really done acoustic recording before. Like he was really, really electronic producer. And so he asked me if I would uh, do with him like uh, um, uh, acoustic recording. So we, a good friend of mine actually um, were, um, is an amazing percussionist, Icelandic percussionist, and we traveled to Iceland and recorded him. He basically, he's a school, he's the headmaster of a school. <laughs> and so we went and stayed with him, and in the night, after working all day in the school, he would record with us, play all his musical instruments. And so we made this archive of percussion and then came back to Berlin and then slowly made that into the music. What was nice for me for that project was I didn't have to sing, I didn't have to think about the lyrics. That was Karen and Matt's department. Me and Olaf just were all about the acoustic recordings and the, the sounds, so the sonics, yeah. But uh, when it was performed, it wasn't how you'd imagined it to be? I think, I think like, because it's an electronic opera, we I mean, to, to kind of replicate that live would have been really a big thing. And I think in the end, we just was like, if we have like, just make a really nice surround sound and just blast it out like as a, an electronic opera can be. And it worked. It was a bit tricky working with the performers a bit, you know, but that's like two fields, different fields coming together, really traditional and not so traditional. You went on tour um, around this kind of period um, with, with The Knife, mm -hmm. uh, with Peaches, mm -hmm. and with LCD Sound System. Actually, it was earlier than that. That, yeah. was, that was like 2007. So in the yeah. period leading up to W, I yeah. guess. Um, how did, did touring with, I guess, what you could call mainstream indie, mm -hmm. bigger, huge indie acts like LCD especially, uh -huh. how did that impact where you wanted to take your music and your career? Um, I mean, there were three very, very different experiences. I mean, touring with Peaches was just like, hello, like, you know, the crowd were just totally into what I did. And with The Knife, um, I mean, you know, it was, I think for all three, it was really nice to tour with friends because they're all friends. But with The Knife, it was a bit more of a sober audience, a bit more reserved. So I think I just terrified them. 
<laughs> um, for LCD sound system, it was very, very interesting because some fans were just like, what the fuck? And then other fans were just like, okay, you know? So I think it made me, um, I just really enjoyed it, but I, I, and I felt very, very lucky as well because um, also all three artists really took care of me as a support artist back then. And I was, you know, I'd, I'd only just started playing. So they really took care of me. Um, but I think it didn't, I don't know if it influenced my making music so much, actually. Yeah. But talking of The Knife, um, mm. I guess they have been kind of an influence on you or probably in both directions. But uh, a particular lyric of theirs kind of inspired the next chapter, I yeah. guess. Um, there was a track that we were playing on the way in from Full of Fire, which has a lyric. Perhaps you'd like to explain how this kind yeah. of lyric kind of triggered the next period of your music. I mean, basically, uh, Karen and Olaf asked me if I would do a remix of um, Full of Fire. And I am, um, you know, I love the track, but I'm listening to it. And then right at the end, there's this like, this, um, let's talk about gender baby. And I'm like, what is that? And it's like, let's talk about gender baby. I'm like, that is such an amazing lyric. Let's talk about gender baby. Like in, let's talk about sex baby. Let's talk about you and me. And it's like squished just at the end. Like, I'm like, that's a song. Oh. So I made a whole like rework um, of their track around that lyric. And then when it came to my album, I'm like, I want to write a whole new song just with that lyric. So that's actually how it happened. And then you push that idea into this feeling of wanting to be really direct, really yeah. blunt with the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell me a bit about how that changed the way that you were making the music itself and what kind of, yeah, how that shaped? I think um, when I came to write All Love's Legal, um, you know, those songs, they, they, they were, you know, there was things I wanted to say and share, and I was aware that writing a song um, like Misogyny Drop Dead could be a bit intense for somebody. And so what I really wanted to do was make music that felt really fun, really open, really, I wouldn't say light, but like really dancey and just brings you to a really nice place and also brings you on the dance floor. And then, then to sing about something like that. And that was really the in a way that the idea behind that record and it really it really worked you know like the the tour for all of legal was just just a party you know like it was like amazing like so much fun and people were like chanting and singing all these these lyrics and having a really fun time at the same time so yeah yeah that's something that the knife have t talked about the idea of um your disco tunes being a bit of a trojan horse for something exactly, else yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense, like, and also, like, you know, historically, that's happened also in house music, you know, like, that you had, like, incredible, like, tunes that just make you move deeply, and then there's, like, a lyric on it that you're, like, whoa, that's, it's a really, it's a really amazing formula, and it, and it, it works, I think. Um, let's have, let's talk about gender, mm. baby. Would you like to sort of introduce it, musically speaking, and maybe tell us a bit about what you were doing with vocals and uh, production? Um, or we can talk about it afterwards if that helps. <laughs> and like classic disco beat. I wanted to be it's class, like really classic. Um, and bassline. Like I, you know, I'm really proud of this bassline. Basslines are really really hard to make. And I've tried. And and whenever I get one that I like, I'm like, um, yeah, I really like this bassline. <laughs> also, Misogyny Drop Dead is a good bassline too. I hope that's okay to say that, but I do think it's good. Um, and uh, yeah, cheesy, super cheesy. You know, cheese is good in music. Yeah, totally went for it. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> were there any particular disco house artists that you were thinking about when you were putting together that record? You just mentioned the uh, brass. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like all types, like all, all sort of genres of disco. Like I, I like the, obviously the original, you know, original disco and also like, you know, politically as well. Um, and then I like, you know, the 80s versions, <laughs> the 90s versions, you know, like, yeah, it's... Sort of tackier sounds in a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've spoken before um, about the idea of queering sonics and this idea that it could be possible to create a music that's not 
heteronormative. So I'd like to ask initially, what, what would you mean by queering sonics? What would that approach involve? Mm. I mean, I, I remember when I, I, I said that in an interview, <laughs> I was like, queering sonics, and then I was like, oh. <laughs> but um, You've got to do it now. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, okay. No, I think, you know, like, you know, I think producing music and working with sound, um, um, it's, you know, and spending so much time with sound and finding your own sound. Like, you know, like when I first started writing music, I was writing music like a lot of other artists that I like. That's how, I think that's how you start, you know? And then finding my own sound. And then, then in a way, on top of that, finding what I wanted to do with music and, and music production. And I like to think in terms of like spectrums, you know, like also in terms of like, gender identity or sexuality, you know, there's a whole spectrum of diversity there, and it's the same with sound for me. You know, sound is like the spectrum of frequencies, of, of charge, of energy, you know, and, and it's very, very diverse. Music, you know, sonically is very diverse, and I think for me, queering sonics was about, in a way, finding my own queer sound, actually. Um, and using sound to combine my, the, my humor, attitude, fun, and a space, uh, and a place, eventually a place because of performing live as well with that. Um, so anyway, that's in a way what Queering Sonics is for me. So when you walk into your studio and you're looking around at what to do, what would you do to try to channel that thought into, or, or rather perhaps once you've come up with something, mm -hmm. how do you work back and make sure that you're kind of doing it the way that is true to your idea? I mean, it, I think it, it's it, it's a lot about. It's not so heady. It's actually very, very instinctual, and especially like when you spend hours. Like, if I think about when I produced, I produced a song called "Public Love," and on that is a synthesized sax sound, and I just was like working on that sound for days until it was so like chunky and aggressive and had so much attitude that then I could put a vocal on it, like a lyric on it. Like it, 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 it could, it gave me that charge where I'm like now anyway I can sing on top of this sound. Um, so to actually dissect it like in a heady sense is a bit difficult, and, but it's more about again like with that sound um, that I worked on for ages that then I get this, I get to this place where I can communicate something and it gets communicated through the sound and it's through the lyrics as well. Is there an element, thinking of yourself as an artist who also has to um, see themselves as a business in a sense, mm. and sell themselves, um, is there an element of the queerness and queering sonics that's anti-capitalist? Hmm, I would... I think it's it's more that in a way it's it's a fight to to not have in a way not to have things commodified, you know. And I mean, you also mentioned that this this pink washing, this like, you know, basically capitalism is about anything that you can make money out of, you know. And what does that mean? And you know, if queerness and as a as a as a topic becomes something that some somebody can make money out of, then it'll get capitalized, and and then it gets commodified, and you know, and then there are consequences to that, and to the integrity of that, and also how that impacts lives and more to do with in a way what really is that is that you know because we're talking about people's lives and people's feelings you know so um and it's a difficult one because you know especially like working as a music producer uh you know it's not easy to make money out of this job um and you know like i do a lot of other jobs i'm, I'm lucky to do other music related jobs like I get commissioned to do like soundtracks and that I'm very, very fortunate like that. But like last year alone, I did seven other jobs. You know, I made a music for um, a documentary, made music for a dance piece, made music for a fashion show, and I'm also trying to make an album between all that. So it isn't easy. So I think a lot about that, like, you know, when people get like offered money in order to make music, in order to express themselves, it's really important, you know? So it's, it's a complicated topic, yeah. I'm interested to know about any of the other projects that you've done recently, mm. because of course, for any kind of relatively underground artist, you do have to sort of look around for other jobs, find mm. other things. Mm. Um, what have you done that's been particularly exciting or, or, or that you're proud of? Um, well, I, um, I wrote 
Um, <laughs> I got asked by a documentary filmmaker that I really love called Norma Mandra. Um, she's French. And she was making a documentary about the uprising of the right wing in France, which was really intense. Uh, and and a, a, like creatively, music, it was really a challenge to make music to uh, footage of Marie Le Pen <laughs> um, speeches. I was like, Ugh. Um, and finding the right tone, finding the, you know what the documentary was saying and what the music needed to say, you know. Um, that was a great project. It was, I mean, creatively, it was really, really challenging. Um, and the fashion show was actually a friend of mine who, um, it was like her first, I'm not, oh my God, I've just gone totally brain dead. The name of the fashion brand that she works for now. But she commissioned me to make a piece for her first fashion show. And that also was quite challenging because also she was a friend and I wanted it to be really good for her. Um, and, and then um, actually for the last three years before, I don't know, like before this year, three years before that, I was working with a choreographer called Ian Kaler and I produced uh, three soundtracks for those pieces, which again was really interesting because it was, it was like a time where I could be, I'm gonna say this now, just a musician, not a performer where I just produced like instrumentals. And actually for the last piece I did vocals, but it was really nice just to be with the gear, with the instruments and just produce music, yeah. And even though you're a solo artist, you do have quite a lot of involvement in your wider community, I guess. Yeah. You also have um, a record label. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain a bit about the sort of purpose of the label? Mm. It actually, I, I started this uh, music label called Human Level and it was after I'd been touring uh, All Loves Legal, actually, um, and the artist Roxy Moore, who's also an electronic uh, musician based here in Berlin, um, she toured a lot with me, and I'm an amazing like uh, musician in her own right, and also a great inspiration, and we'd, we, would, we spent so much time together, it was just me and her, and she was producing her own music, and I was like, I want to release a 12 inch together. And so basically I started Human Level so that I could put a record out with me and, and Hermione's music. Um, and that's how it started. It was also my way of in a way saying thank you back to her. And also, I'm, you know, I'm a really big believer of like sharing platforms. Like, you know, I'm very, very lucky because people have used their opportunities and their like privileges in order to, you know, uh, give me chance, you know, to put out my music. And it, it's really how it works. Like, if you've got a platform, share it, you know, definitely, so. Um, kind of brings us to close to the, the new album. I mean, we had the track Transom earlier. Um, I guess, well, what have, you, what have you done on this album that you couldn't have done on the previous albums? You were saying that's kind of got you to this new, Place and that track is is auto tune, right? Rather than a different type of pitching technique. Actually, um, it is a pitcher. It's a it's um, a TC Helicon uh, pitcher. It's a little pedal, and it actually has a knob on it called gender, <laughs> and it can be gender off, gender on. I'm like, I'm down with that, and gender hard, or gender soft. And I'm always in the middle, a little hard, a little soft. So, <laughs> and it's it's. I'm not doing any promotion here now, I know I'm not allowed, but it is really amazing. And um, and that's what I use on this record quite a lot. I think if it's gear, you're allowed to talk about All it. All right. Heart's content. <laughs> um, so it's not auto-tune as we know it? From well, the, well, the thing is, is it's not strictly auto-tune, but it still tries to put me in tune. <laughs> and so sometimes it's like, hmm, you know, a little bit accidental auto-tune. <laughs> <laughs> it still has quite different connotations, though, I think. And this record, um, which... I mean, it's not out, but I've heard it. Um, it's, it sounds more, I mean, perhaps more American in some senses. It has a sort of okay. pop and yeah. R&B flavor to it. Yeah. Um, can you tell us something more about the, this kind of musical chapter and anything mm. new that you've learned? Um, I think with this record, it's, it is the most personal record I've ever written because, it, and it's also the record that I feel the most vulnerable. Like I... I've really shared a lot about myself and about my life. It's very biographical, actually. So, um, and it features songs about my family and people close to me. And, you know, like when I was writing it, I, like I had up to about 30 tracks, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of material. Um, 
And again, like trying to, like from a lyrical standpoint, what I really like to do is if I want to say something, and even like for this record, something that is so personal, say for example, like I wrote a song about my mum, and there's so much I could say about my mum, but just to fit it in a song was such a challenge to find what it was that lyrically I could use to communicate what I was trying to say about my mum. And it ended up being like a kind of an anecdote. That's what I use as lyrically. And I really like lyrics that are also mm, not too complicated. <laughs> I like, I, you know, that's why I like pop in that sense. In a way, it's very to the point and um, e economic, you know, lyrically. And so I think for me, I feel, I feel, I hope that I have achieved even more that that skill that I'm into, you know, into um, writing sort of um, kind of like pop songs in a way, but but that have, like they're a little bit different, yeah. And did you feel the same, um, the same feeling, trying to be so direct about family as mm. you had done with the previous album, mm. about patriarchy, feminism mm. and so on? I mean, I think the difference was talking about things so close to me was, was like, you know, I, I I am a bit nervous about everybody hearing it, you know, and so far, like, you know, it's been, the feedback's been amazing. Um, um, and it's also something that I had to do. Again, for me, music has really been a space where, um, a healing space, a place where I could let go of stuff, a place where I could, you know, if you, if you release something, you, you re literally release it, and then you get to look at it, and then, then it's gone, and it's, it's, it's like, it's a relief as well, and this album is definitely a, a, a healing album, um, and, and an educational one. Music is my education, ultimately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a... It's a cliche that music is therapy, but clearly that's why a lot of people start to make music in the first yeah. place. And yeah, perhaps you wouldn't have been able to say any of those things mm. had you not, you know, got to that point. Mm. Um, it's a really good album. <laughs> it's not out yet. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, to talking about gender equality would be, you know, pertinent on any day in history, really, but uh, particularly, why not today, where mm. we wake up to a bunch of women getting arrested, um, protesting against the Supreme Court nominee. Um, I kind of wondered if there was anything, the, the mood of the last year or so in mm. the public sphere fed into what you were doing at all, if you fed off of that. I, I think um, it's funny, like, it, th these things are happening and are talked about in the media, but what I feel more, more and more that you know this is this is just part of everybody's lives, you know, um, and and it's great that the media is talking about it, but just because the media is talking about it doesn't mean that it suddenly oh now it exists. It has existed, you know. Also like the politics that we that we have to live in, you know. Um, uh, so I think it's good that the media is talking about it, um, but what I feel in my kind of more immediate circle of friends and families, you know, different kinds of families, is how we support each other, you know. And I think around this topic, the more that we share stories, the more that we believe the stories and give those stories the space, um, that's really important because I feel, I feel like a lot of friends and families, um, a lot of my family friends, um, that there's a sense of being quite overwhelmed by how, the, by the present day. And I think it's really important that we all take care of each other. And this is something that I try and talk about also on the album is um, the sentiment of care, you know, like the power of care. Like my, my mother, for example, has been my sister's carer all her life. And this is like unpaid, like caregiving, you know, nobody sees it and yet, it's incredible, and it, it happens all over the world. Where millions and millions of people are doing this, and that is such a beautiful, powerful thing. And so, I think it's it's how we deal with it in our lives is really important. Um, I'd like to open up for some questions in a second. If anybody has anything, um, perhaps while you just quickly think of something, um, you did mention your your circle. Um, I mean, Berlin, as we're here, it's, it's, it's a haven for 
artists um, to maybe come and live here and be kind of outside the mainstream, mm. in a sense. Um, but I guess the purpose of making such a pop record is to make an impact beyond yeah. that community. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, and also, you know, like I, I you know, I have my friends here and my family's here, but um, but a lot, I have a lot of friends everywhere, you know, and I have a lot of. This is gonna sound so cheesy, but you know, like your cyber friends, whatever, you know, like people that you, and also people that I've never met, that I have really long conversations with online, like, um, so. Um, and definitely for this record, it's been interesting since my last record came out, which was 2014, how much this talking with people online is, for me, is intensified, like, and it's really important, yeah. So yeah, definitely I want this record to, to connect, you know, outside of Berlin, for sure. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, being a songwriter and a producer of your own songs, mm. uh, is there like a special way you approach the process? Because you also mentioned that on one of the tracks you took a sound to a level where it was like chunky enough, so yeah. it like charged you to do something specific. So yeah. is it always like that, or I guess it? I don't. Yeah. It's a really good question. Um, it took me a while to work that out, but I think it really is that that sometimes like I will create an instrumental and then. There's just something, like it has something, and I'm like, oh, okay, it's bringing out something me lyrically. I can imagine I'll try and sing on something like that. Um, so that inspires the vocal, and then sometimes absolutely flip more. Sometimes like I will just like lay down a vocal, like I, I don't know. And then anyway, I'll build around the vocal, so it's, it's usually one of the two, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll maybe ask one more question. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there a special way you treat your vocals apart from using a uh, TC Helicon pitch? Yeah. Um, uh, which mic you use? I'm, I'm getting too technical, maybe. But <laughs> no, AKG uh, uh, C14. Four, there. Four yeah, one the, four. yeah, it's um, the C14. I love them. Like, you know, AKG, I'm a big fan. Sorry, more promotion. But, um, and it's really affordable. It's like not that expensive, and I, I really like it. Um, because I pitch my vocal, I have to EQ it a lot. Um, there's a lot of low end on it, so and I like a little slap back and a bit of reverb. And I love digital reverbs. That's the other thing. There's this snobbery about reverbs, like what plate you're using, and the, and I'm, I, you know, like I use a lot of Ableton's own digital effects. I love them so. Hi, thank you for coming today. My thank name you. is Sequoia. Um, hey. Hey, I used to actually listen to your song Beyond Binary Binds in high school. It's like a really short, like one minute something track. I, I should just, have made it longer, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it was really cool because I would just like sometimes want to hear that texture and so I would turn Sweet. that on. I remember being in PE and like listening to that. Yay. But anyway, I wanted to just comment on um, how you were talking about finding the humor in music and mm. specifically saxophone and certain things. and. I definitely understand that, and I think like a lot of times some people don't want to find humor in songs, but like there's a lot of things that I listen to that are like horrible on purpose, and that's a separate <laughs> side of me from like my main musical side, which is like very very serious and driven. I have another side that like loves to find the most horrible like things to just laugh at, and I just thought that was interesting to like hear someone else talk about that. Thank I just you wanted so to much. share that with you as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It, it's true. It's like it's a whole like. You know, again, like again, music can be it can just do so many things. You can be so playful with it, and but I, I totally hear what you say. Like that, it's like there's like almost like taboo areas. You know, yeah, nice. Hmm? And maybe because you've now had several albums, you've mm. been able to do a different thing on each album. So you know, when you're at a stage in your career where you maybe haven't done an album yet, mm. it's like a lot of pressure to choose like what you're gonna do, I guess, but maybe after you've got a few out of the way. Yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> yeah, it definitely took me three albums to get to Bind and, um, and Beyond Binary Binds, for sure. Yeah, and that track also was so much fun to make. It was just like, and, and playing live as well was really great. It was really, really cute, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, we heard a lot about your process with songwriting, making albums. Mm. Um, I know we'll see you perform later tonight, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear a bit about how you, if you're thinking a lot about your live performance when you're writing music or how you mm. translate one to the other. Mm. 
Good question. Um, all right, really short. Um, when I first started making music and I wanted to play it live, I was like, I'm going to do it all live. And I got like eight musicians to play with me and it was a bloody nightmare. Like really just so much work and, and I, w I was just kind of like too far ahead and my music at that point had orchestral sounds in it and all this, you know. I had a bassoon player in my first band. <laughs> Oh my God. So, and, and nothing against the musicians, it was just a bit ambitious, you know. So, um, so then I just cut it down and I was like, playback, playback video, me, microphone, done, you know. And, um, and I really like those kind of shows as well when you just got someone on the decks, someone on the mic. It, there's something really good about it. And I toured like that for years, you know, literally my own little like show in a bag. And, um, but for this album, um, or apart from like All Loves Legal when I was touring with Roxy Moore. Um, for this album, I'm actually producing a larger live show. And um, I've been fortunate enough to get some funding together. So I have like a light designer and a set designer and, and all these things. And the reason I wanted to do this for this show is because, back to humor, um, I wanted, like whenever I tour, like when it gets in between the songs, I never know what to say, but I always want to say something. So I'm always like, thank you. Or, mm. um, and I'm like, okay, I want to face that head on. I want to try and put a show together where I learn how to talk between songs and I have something to say because it's, it's a skill. You know, when I see artists do it and they're just chatting and I'm like, my God, that's amazing. And I want to learn it. So for this time, I've, I'm putting a show together and I'm rehearsing it because normally I never rehearse. I have a week, we learn the songs and it's on the road. And so this time it's like making a show where I can actually talk a little bit. And also with the music playing in the background a little bit, just like chatting about some of the subjects that I'm talking about. And it's really fun. It's really fun. Yeah. You said that you have some kind of uh, of um, producer collective here, right? I wouldn't yeah. say collective. It's more like um, that that um, I, I know. Like I have producer friends, yeah. And and in our studio that I um, that I put together with my friend, we uh, we share it like all together. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit more about how that works and how you work together, or if you work alone in different rooms, or if you or a, a bit about the logistics yeah. behind the overlaps. it and how you... Yeah. I mean, we have a Google calendar together. <laughs> and uh, and we, we fight a lot for the rooms. Like, I'm in the big room, I'm in the small room. Um, the great thing is we have this really small social room. We call it the social room where there's, like, you can make tea and stuff. And we're all workaholics. Like, usually when we see each other, we're like... Like deadlines and then, you know, but then there's moments where then we'll sit and have a tea and we'll be in the social room and then, or one of us wants to hear something. So like when I started to finish the album more, you know, I would say like to the others, like, come and listen to this track or what do you think of this? Or for example, for this record, I worked with uh, a mixer, amazing mixer called Marta. Holy crap. She has an Italian surname. Salonia. Thank you. Thank you. She is phenomenal. And she would send me the mixes. So... You know, you send a track to a mixer, and usually you hear it, and you're like, mm, it's like, mm, go up, change it. She would send me something back, and it just sounded so much better than I could have imagined. I had nothing to say. So I was literally to my friends like, come and listen to this mix. It was amazing. So like for things like this, like, you know, like sharing, stuff like that, and also gear. Ah, so do, do you also walk, walk into each other's studios and like, oh, I could add this, or I could record this, or do you want to record a violin on this you, one or? ah you mean yeah actually for for this record um uh sky deep who is one of the producers working in the studio um she's an amazing guitarist and her guitar electric guitar is called janet after janet jackson and um and her and janet came in the room and we did a little recording together so yeah it's it's a really beautiful space for that and we have like another tiny space that we pile all our gear in like all our tom drums or cymbals or whatever like percussion we have and um and it, we just everybody can use it at, at all times sounds amazing <laughs> thank you also lucy on that note of working with other uh Berlin artists. You, you briefly had the Aquarian Jugs alias. Uh, yeah. 
Is that ever happening again? It's like a techno alias, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> Aquarian jokes. Um, <laughs> it's so dirty. I mean, it is dirty. It's meant to be dirty. Um, yeah, it's a side project that at one time I would love to pursue more. I have, I've produced a lot of tracks on it, and they're really funny and just pure like dance tracks. But um, when I get the time, yeah, I'll definitely just. I think I should just put them out, like just put them online. Yeah. Great. Well, then I would like to say thank you to. Planning I just wanted to, to ask. Oh. Didn't didn't you have a question? You didn't get the mic. I'm I, sorry. I'm just sorry. curious what you wanted to oh, ask. Put no, your hands cool. down again. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for sharing so much about so many facets of what you do. You. Um, something you said early on, um, I think kind of pertaining to like your inspiration or songwriting, you're talking about being in like transient moving. Yeah. Are there any places that you haven't been or you have been that you haven't written in that in your mind's eye you'd like to go and like write and, and have a process in a certain mm -hmm. place? Is there like a gemstone somewhere? That's a really good question. You know? um, because for this record, it was the first time that I, because All Love's Legal, I, just for economic reasons, I had like six months to, to record it and get out on the road so I can start earning money. <laughs> and, um, and so I had six months and so I was just, I locked myself in the studio basically. But so for this album, exactly because I was moving around a lot, I was recording in living rooms, I was recording in airports, like everywhere. Um, and I liked that, like it was, uh, because the studio can be, it can be sometimes not an inspirational place at all, you know. Um, I even like, when we were in New York, I was, I recorded one vocal from this album in my friend's closet, literally. <laughs> Like, because it was the driest place to get a good vocal. So, but I have to think about that. That's such a good question. You just get back to me. Yeah, I'll get back to you. Thank, Thank you. Us. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, apologies for that full sending. Uh, planning to rock, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.